we've been doing a study about the Bible, about the Word of God. And uh, today I entitled it Understanding the Scriptures. And that's, uh, in the technical sense, what they call that when you're in seminary is hermeneutics. And I'm not going to give you the full 13-week course on that today, but uh, we both kind of touched on a couple of highlights about how can we better understand God's Word. That's really important to you and I, is how do we know that? And I think in my um, outline I gave you, I started off with a very familiar, if you understand realty at all, realty, the uh, phrase of location, location, location. And what I'm just getting at there is, um, so often what the scripture is saying has to do with the context and where it's written, where you find it. So it's very important not to just pick a verse out and, and say, this is the one that I'm going to um, think about and, and listen to. If you need to study that within the, the uh, writing of the, of the person and, and understand a little bit of the historical. And, uh, and what I would call myself, as far as my uh, hermeneutical um, uh, philosophy, would be I am what, what most people would call a literal uh, person, literalist, but I translate some of this and understand it literally. Now, there's several schools of thoughts, and probably the one most opposite of that would be uh, the allegorical, which says, yeah, I know what it says, but it's all parable. It just means something, and you need to uh, float around and find out what it means. My biggest problem with that is then that puts the whole meaning on me and not on what God gave us. Uh, and I, I look at scripture as literal as possible. And when you interpret something literally, that doesn't mean that absolutely everything is literal to the, to the dotted eye. Uh, for instance, and I think we mentioned this a long time ago, uh, we would take Jesus literal when he says to us um, that you should love one another, uh, even as you love yourself. We should love other people as well. But most of us here, have not taken Jesus quite literally when he says, if your right hand offends you, cut it off. Or if your eye offends you, pluck it out. I'm looking around and we got a variety of the illnesses and injuries in the room, but I don't see those. And so we're probably not that literal. And, and that's part of the context. You try to just understand. So to make this a little bit simpler, um, I'm going to suggest that there's really um, two ways to approach that whole understanding of the scriptures. How, how can we know what the Bible's saying? And uh, one of them is, this is really simplifying, you need to study. You, you know, you're not going to understand the scriptures. I, I saw something someone wrote um, the other day, and, and I don't know this person at all. Uh, they were criticizing a Christian, a, a person that I know who's a very strong Christian, put on their Facebook um, that they are a believer in Jesus and they follow him. That's all they said. This other person just attacked them and, and said, you know, that uh, you're being pushy and, and all kinds of stuff. And they said, I've read the Bible a few times and I know that salvation is totally up to you. You have to get your own salvation. And I thought, okay, you read the Bible a few times. I would really like to question you about that. Um, I, I'm seriously doubt that their idea of reading the Bible and my idea of reading the Bible are anywhere near each other. I, I know that we are told um, clearly in Scripture that we need to do some studying. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, it, uh, the King James says, study to show yourself approved, but study. Do your best. Present yourself before God as one who is approved. That takes work. Uh, I don't just, uh, you know, see a Bible verse on a billboard somewhere and all of a sudden be good. Uh, I need to I need to know what God is telling me. There's a whole lot of other verses. I just off the top of my head through in Jude verse three, where it talks about we need to contend for the faith. That, that means we need to to work hard to understand what we know, what we believe, what God has communicated to us, so that we can communicate that to our loved ones, to our offspring, to people we care about, and and can have a good standing uh, in the presence of God. So. One of the approaches that I would just simply say, you know, boiling everything down to one or two statements, I would say if you really want to understand the Word of God, you've got to study it. You've got to look at it and work hard 
And uh, that is not an easy thing for any of us to do. The other one is actually that you cannot understand the scriptures. You cannot. In fact, um, you cannot understand the scriptures unless the Holy Spirit guides you. You've got to have the leading and the, and the guidance of the Spirit of God uh, working in your life um, to lead you so that you can know what God is communicating. So that's, that's an important point that we're going to try to illustrate and make uh, a little bit more real today. Because without the Spirit of God teaching you and speaking to you and telling you what you're studying and what you're looking at and, and giving you help and meaning, um, you're not going to comprehend that at all. And there's reasons why. We'll go into that as we, as we keep moving along here. Uh, the key word in um, the passage that we're, we've been looking at and going to be looking at in 1 Corinthians, I'm going to look at chapter 1 and, and verse 2. The key word is the word wisdom. Listen to the, what it says here in verse chapter 1, verse 17, and also verse 18. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Not with words of human wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. And then in chapter 1, verse 18, it says, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it's the power of God. The, the word wisdom is, is a very key word in the verses that are to follow. In, in chapters 1 and 2, and even into chapter 3, uh, the Apostle Paul's writing about the gospel, and he's trying to uh, interact with the intellectual person. That key word is wisdom. It appears 21 times as you read through this text here. And um, the other word that we just saw was the word foolishness. Um, the word foolishness here in the Greek is the word that we took close into English. It would be the word moron in English. Um, but in the Greek, it just means stupidity or a dullness intellectually. So he's contrasting. There's the wisdom and there's foolishness. And one, uh, you know, what wisdom is, that's bright, that's sharp, that's applying what you learn and using it and making it work for you compared to the foolishness, which is dull and, and uh, stupidity. And, and he goes on to say in there, too, uh, about those who are in the foolish area uh, are perishing. And he's not talking about becoming extinct or their, uh, but it's, it has to do with their lives are ruined. They have come to ruin. Um, they have lost all their well being. There's nothing good. These are people who are anxious, people who, um, who have no foundation, uh, and it's very, very difficult. But he said at the end that the power is in the cross of Jesus Christ. There's a power in the cross that we, we need, that we can get, and it comes from God. I like what Dr. Boyer says in his commentary. The vindication of the cross is not wisdom. See, that's, where, that's where Paul's going to come here. What he's doing is he's arguing against those who take strictly an intellectual approach to the gospel. And the vindication of the cross of Christ is not wisdom. The fact that it all makes sense, it does, but, but it doesn't unless you have the Spirit of God working in your heart. But the vindication is that it works. It's powerful. And, and it changes lives. That's what vindicates the cross of Christ and the gospel. Because people get saved, people's lives are changed, and their hearts are changed, and, and there's a whole new direction for everything that they do. I think in your uh, outline, I have a whole bunch of um, summary statements, that, something like this. Verses chapter 1, 18 through 25, talks about the gospel is foolish as to its content. They just uh, really thought, this is crazy. Because of my life, some guy dies somewhere else, and that's supposed to impact me. Or you could say something that happened 2,000 years ago is supposed to have an influence on what I do today. Uh, to some people, that just does not make any sense whatsoever. Uh, in fact, in the, um, in, in the 
passage there, it, it actually talks about to the Jews in verse 22 that the cross is a stumbling block. And it was a stumbling block because they wanted a Messiah. They wanted a political Savior Messiah who would come and rescue them from the, um, the subjugation that they had to Rome. And they were looking for that. They were not looking for a crucified Savior. That's not what they were wanting. That's not what they were anticipating. To the Greeks, it was foolishness because the Greeks just in general despised anyone who was crucified. People who were crucified were lower level and and uh, just very, very bad. Uh, there was no wisdom there. They would loathe those people and they would just uh, scorn them uh, as the very lowest. Paul also argues that the gospel is foolish in respect to the recipients. You know, not only is there it doesn't make sense. It's a lack of wisdom just to say you know, a cross can save somebody else and could save somebody thousands of years later. And that didn't make sense. But also the ones who received that, the ones who became believers, um, Paul would be talking about himself. But he also was looking at the Corinthian church and saying, look at you. There's nobody here that's that outstanding. There's no Pulitzer Prize winners or, or you know, any of those kind of things. We're not, we're not the elite. And so it, it doesn't make sense. You would think, well, God would want to go after the best of the best. But he doesn't. He goes after us. He goes after those of us of all, all levels. Um, it's also uh, the gospel is foolish as to the messenger. And Paul would put himself definitely in that category, uh, just saying that, you know, this is crazy. I am not the one who should be bringing this message, but I am. And he tells us that he doesn't do it by persuasion, but he does it by demonstration of his life. He cannot argue somebody into the kingdom of God. The thing that changes is when they see what God has done in his life. So it's very definite that there's a difference between the worldly wisdom and the wisdom of God. Uh, the world measures things differently. The way they measure success is different than the way God measures it. The way they look at the origin and the purpose of life is different than the way God looks at it. The way they look at life after life is different than the way God looks at it. Um, there's all kinds of differences. What is strength? What is weakness? What is love? God looks at all that stuff differently than what the world around us would tell us to look at. It. Well, later on in, in these texts, uh, Paul's going to tell us that the gospel, however, really is great wisdom. It's great what God has given to us. We've already heard a little bit of 1 Corinthians 2, but I would like to read a little bit more for you. I'm going to read uh, verses 1 through 9. That has some of what was in there. Paul said, when I came to you, brothers, I didn't come with eloquence or superior wisdom as I proclaimed to you the testimony about God. For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I came to you in weakness and fear and with much trembling. My message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power, so that your faith might not rest on men's wisdom, but on God's power. We do, however, speak a message of wisdom among the mature, but not the wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. No, we speak of God's secret wisdom, a wisdom that has been hidden, and that God destined for our glory before time began. None of the rulers of this age understood it, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. However, as it is written, no eye has seen, no, nor ear has heard, no mind has conceived what God has prepared for those who love him. They were thinking about the gospel in philosophical terms. They were totally blind to the things of God. But it's wisdom, a wisdom of an entirely different kind that God was showing to them. People who do not know God, do not love God, do not follow Him, do not obey Him, cannot, do not, and cannot understand. Because the source is God. He's the origin of this wisdom. And you have to be in him and have him 
in order to understand this. Um, verse 9 there is a verse that I know a lot of people, a lot of Christian people are really popular to them. And sometimes we think of that about uh, the glories of heaven. How wonderful. Oh, you know, the eyes have not seen and the ears have not heard and your mind can't comprehend all the great things God has for you. But actually, in the context, and that's true, we don't understand or comprehend all the great things that God has. But in the context, it's talking about God's every day, every moment of the day, work in your life and in my life. And we can't even begin to comprehend the wisdom behind what God is doing. Uh, the greatness, the faithfulness of what he's doing in our lives and, and what he wants to accomplish to us. Um, and certainly the natural person is unable to see that as well. In verses 10 and uh, 11 and 12, it goes on to say, But God has revealed it to us by his Spirit. The Spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. For who among men knows the thoughts of man except the man's spirit within him? In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. We have not received the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, that we may understand what God has freely given to us. So this wisdom that God has is hidden from the wise, but it's revealed to chosen men. Got men and women who were chosen by God, uh, some to write out the scriptures as they were moved along, by the Holy Spirit of God. Sort of like they were his private little secretaries uh, who were bringing God's thoughts to, to God's people. I'd like a quote that I found from a Baptist pastor in Plano, Texas, in all places. Truly, we would be without knowledge of our Creator unless He came to us speaking our language. Now, there's a couple emphasis I'd like to put on that. We would have no knowledge of God we would have absolutely no knowledge of who he is, what he has done, unless he came, unless he came to us. There's no way, there's no way we know anything about God. I would just blindly go up through life thinking this is it and that's all there is, unless God came to me and unless he was speaking my language. God does that. I, I like the phrase, I, I use it once in a while, but Jesus, God, is eternally relevant. He's always relevant. He's all that there is. He's always the creator. He's always God. He's always real. He's always relevant to us. He is eternally relevant. And he wants to communicate to us. He's speaking our language. He's trying to communicate and let us know that he is very, very real. And then in verses 13 through 16, it says that this can only be understood by spiritual man. In verse 13, I'll, I'll read through that for you. It says, this is what we speak, not in words taught us by human wisdom, but in words taught by the Spirit, expressing spiritual truths in spiritual words. The man without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, and he cannot understand them, because they are spiritually discerned. The spiritual man makes judgments about all things, but he himself is not subject to any man's judgment. For who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. It is God interpreting spiritual things to people who are spiritual. And that combine, he'll combine thoughts and words and, and make it make sense. The thing that I want to combat here a little bit is for the, the attitude of someone who says, well, I am spiritual, therefore I'm better. I'm just, I'm, I'm higher, I'm above everybody else because God gives me information that he doesn't give anybody else. Well, he probably gives the same information to everybody else, but he just prompts you to have a greater understanding of it uh, and maybe even a better application of it in your life. But you are not better than anyone else because of it. In fact, if there's anything better, anything really amazing about it, it is the fact that it is God who is indwelling you and giving you that information. That is amazing when you think about it. The spiritual man is qualified to make some preliminary uh, decisions and judgments. Um, the term here in Scripture 
uh, is sort of like a legal thing, like a grand jury where they, they get an investigation and they can make a preliminary uh, decision based on it. And you and I can look at scripture, we can look at life, and we can make decisions, and we can uh, we can deal with things like that. But ultimately, God is the one who's judged. Now, I don't have the final corner of truth. I like to think God helps me understand some truth, and maybe even apply some of it, but it's not that way for me, and it's not that way for you either. Um, so, what's the bottom line? Understanding the scriptures, uh, in verse 10, we saw the what of it, that God has revealed. He's revealed his word. He's given us a communication. It's there. It's in our hands. It's right in front of you. Uh, you can pick it up. You can read it. It is the revelation of God that comes to us through the Holy Spirit. Then the who is that it's given to us freely, but it's given by the Holy Spirit. Really, the Holy Spirit is probably, I would have no problem with saying the Holy Spirit is the author of Scripture in the sense that he's inspired the writers and he's the one who helps you discern and understand what's going on in Scripture. And how he does that, in verse 15, is by the illuminates it. Now, illumination is probably one of the big studies in Scripture about the Holy Spirit. It just means that when you read God's Word, it's the Holy Spirit that speaks to your heart, speaks to your mind, and helps you have understanding. You probably have, I, I would hope everybody in this room has had the experience once in their life, at least, to read something in the Bible and say, wow, that makes sense. I understand that. So that's the way it, it is in life, or that's why this happens that way. All of us should have that somewhere. Well, that's not just because you and I are so brilliant. It's probably also because the Spirit of God is, is opening our, our hearts and our eyes and helping us to see that. In fact, a great prayer that always um, think of when you go to study in Scripture is in Psalm 119, where it says, Open my eyes that I may behold wonderful things from your law. It's a great thing. When you sit down to read scripture, that's probably the first thing you should be thinking is, God, open my eyes, open my mind, open my heart, so that what you're telling me from your word, I can get it, that I can understand it, and not just understand it, but so that it can, it can change me and change my life. A very important thing. I, I also had, I don't know if it's in your outline, but in 1 John 2.27, it just talks about the anointing of the Holy Spirit on, on those so that we can have understanding. Here's a bunch of quotes that I just thought I'd throw out for no reason other than they're good. Martin Luther says, The Bible cannot be understood simply by study or talent. Smart people can study it, but they don't always get it, but they can study it. But you must count on the influence of the Holy Spirit. Now, that's Martin Luther one from a few hundred years ago. Um, also, John Calvin says, the testimony of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, is superior to reason. I don't care how smart you are, you're not smarter than God. And so the Spirit is superior to reason. For these words will not obtain full credit in the hearts. You won't get it completely in the hearts of men until they're sealed in the inward testimony of the Spirit of God. You're not going to understand things until the Spirit of God applies it to you. And then John MacArthur found this, but he doesn't know where it came from. But it said, the best man can do on his own is to gnaw the bark of Scripture without getting to the wood. I don't know what that means, but it makes sense. To me. So, uh, you know, we can, we can go at it. We can look at the Bible. We can uh, study things, but without having a relationship with God, and without having the guidance of the Holy Spirit, uh, it's not going to do any good for us. The neat thing is, you and I as believers in Christ have a truth teacher, and he's the Holy Spirit of God, and he dwells and lives within us. I was going to put this somewhere in print, but it's too long, but, uh, but it really does summarize the whole thing. Something that John MacArthur says in, in one of his commentaries on 1 Corinthians, he says, the doctrine of illumination, that is the Spirit of God, just speaking and, and making it all make sense. The doctrine does not mean that we can know and understand everything. It's not. 
Deuteronomy 29 tells us that you know, God is just too great, too fast for us. We're not going to get it. We're not going to get everything or understand. And he's not going to tell us everything that we wish he would. But um, that we and that we do not, it also does not imply that we don't need human teachers. Because we do. Ephesians 4 tells us that, you know, God's given to the church some pastors and some teachers and and a whole list of other people for helping us to do what we need to do. And it doesn't, it also does not mean that we don't need to study it. We already looked at 2 Timothy 2. But it does mean that the scripture can be understood by every Christian who is diligent and obedient. All you have to do is just read and obey. And if you do, God will keep working in your heart. And you don't have to be a genius. Uh, you don't have to be the brightest person. What is required is that we just submit to God and to his will. If, if for whatever reason you have trouble understanding scripture, then go back to it. Study it some more. Look at it. It's okay to use tools. You know, look at commentaries or what other great men of God have, have said about it. That's fine. That's a good thing to do. If you find that it is all gobbledygook, it makes no sense, then maybe search your heart and see what the relationship with Christ is. Is he really Lord of your life? Is he really um, your Savior? Have you been rescued from your sins? These are important issues. These are eternal issues. And we need to be absolutely sure that we stand on solid ground in Christ. Let's pray together. Father, I just thank you so much for your love and your grace that you've shown to us through Jesus. Thank you for the gift of the Spirit of God who abides within us and leads us into all truth. And we don't have a corner, Lord, but we know that uh, you want us to know what we need to know to live this life, to live it victoriously, trusting and obeying you, and to live eternally uh, in your home forever. Thank you for the gifts of life and the gift of eternal life we have in Christ. We just honor you this day with our worship. And we pray.